Good morning or good afternoon, depending on what side of the country you're joining us from. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have you along for a, a great presentation. Uh, we're continuing our educational series here at McQueen Financial Advisors with Investments 101. And really excited uh, to have this presentation today in a different economic environment. A few housekeeping things. If you have any questions, uh, if you move your cursor on your screen, you'll see a, a bar open up. and You'll be able to see a question and answers. It's at the top of mine. Sometimes it's at the bottom. But Q&A, please feel free to click that and enter in any question you may have. And uh, we will then answer the question uh, at that point or later if it makes sense in the presentation. As with all of our webinars, they are recorded and are kept on our YouTube channel. Please reach out to your MFA advisor to uh, get a link sent to you, or you can Google it. Uh, if you would like a copy of the presentation, please reach out to your advisor, and they'll be able to pass one along with you. So thank you very much. I'm Charlie McQueen, President of McQueen Financial Advisors. I'm thrilled to be here with uh, Craig Cecilia, our Chief Investment Officer and Managing Director. Craig, thank you for joining me. And uh, excited, Craig uh, runs investment advisory business and oversees all the activities of bond buying, uh, our alternative investment portfolios, credit reporting and credit work, uh, lots of activity in our core area. Uh, along with Craig, we do have our, our in the investment team. We also have our asset liability management team and our valuation team. But Craig, thank you for being here with uh, your expertise. Uh, you've been instrumental in predicting the economic condition and, and also making excellent investment choices. Uh, for a number of years now. Thank you, Thanks. Craig. Yep, you're welcome, Charlie. Good afternoon and good morning to everybody on the call. Appreciate you joining us. Well, we're going to have a little fun today. Uh, as usual, we always like to start off with an economic update and uh, talk a little bit about what's going on. Which I'm going to say you were right and Craig's going to say I told you so a few times, so be prepared for that. Uh, but we're going to talk about an economic update, uh, what's happened. Uh, then we're going to get into uh, then the investment area and talk about policies and strategies and asset class diversification and trading and documentation. At the end, we'll save some time for question and answers. And uh, we're, we're happy to answer again any question you have along the way. So as we go forward, we'll kick off and, and talk about interest rates. And, and you can see my level of, of uh, you know, movies here uh, with the move, the movie home, uh, but interest rates are rising. I know it's got a lot of people nervous about rising rates, but I'm excited about rising rates because of earnings. And you know, we've been in this terrible margin environment for a number of years now, and uh, this will help us start to uh, improve earnings and, and get much better investment yields. And uh, with that, our first treasury graph of the day, uh, definitely interesting here. And, and uh, we used to talk about uh, being a, you'd call it, I believe, a steep yield curve, a good-looking steep yield curve. And, and now what do we have here, Craig? It, it, it doesn't really look like a steep, good-looking yield curve because the red one is uh, that picture was taken just a couple days ago on May 23rd. Absolutely. We've lost the uh, steepness through the belly of the curve and just have a really, a really steep front end out uh, to one year. So we've lost what some people consider a little bit of value. So it's really the shape has changed, which, uh, you know, actually is a good basis for potentially looking at some different types of trades within the portfolios. Yeah, it is. It is interesting to me when we get to a flat yield curve like this, and, and we may talk about an inverted yield curve in the next slide here. But uh, you know, flat yield curves really are tough for people to understand at times. Where, hey, if I can buy a, a two-year treasury for a two sixty-one, and I can buy a, a, a five-year treasury for two eighty, why would I go out for twenty basis points? And you know, time and time again, when we get flat yield curves or inverted yield curves, there is a uh, a pretty good indicator that you should be probably even going a little bit longer than your typical duration. So, uh, and, and, and speaking of typical indicators here, um, my one of my favorite graphs is, is Craig. I know you know you've heard me say that probably a million times, uh, but this graph is going back to 2002. The red dotted line is Fed funds. The blue line is the two-year Treasury, and the black line is the 10-year Treasury. And uh, we can see here as the Fed has raised rates back in 2005, six and and also, you know, 1718, we, we get to those high points with those flat yield curves where all the lines combine, and, and then we tend to see different things happen thereafter. Um, you know, I think, uh, is this telling us it's a, a good time to buy longer term securities? It's interesting. If you look at that blue line, the two-year treasury and its proximity to the 10-year, we're only a, a 23 as of this morning basis points difference there. And it's telling us that uh, 
we're, we're not going to be in an environment where rates will continue to rise for a long period of time. They probably will drift up a little bit as a, a, in June, but ultimately it's saying in three years from now, we're going to probably be in a lower rate environment than we are today is what I'm seeing. Yeah, I was working on getting my laser pointer here and flipping slides by mistake, so I apologize for making those comments. Um, but what you're talking about here is how we, we look here with the 10-year treasury and the the uh, two-year treasury right on top of each other, as we did here and, and also back here, is that the point you were making. Correct. That's right. And lasers are good, unless the shark swims away. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, we definitely are seeing a bit of history repeating itself, and, um, and hopefully um, maybe not a recession coming. I do think that's one of the points we'll, we'll come to here is a thought of a recession. In some ways, though, one would say is that the Fed may be behind the, the curve here a little bit. Maybe, maybe not. I've been saying they are, and I could be wrong. Uh, but here we have the last couple of Fed funds increases. We just had a 25 basis points and a 50 basis points for a total of 75. And um, one of the things that, Craig, you were right on that I've struggled with was a projection here. And now this is the, the implied rates by the betting in the Fed funds market here. And it's showing here that uh, June 15, the Fed's going to raise rates, uh, you know, looking at up to 150, uh, July 2%. Uh, 250, 275, three, and staying at three. And you've been a bit lower than this. And, and then actually in the last couple of days, we've, we've seen some um, reality come through that maybe the, the market is definitely thinking a little bit lower like you've been all along here. Yeah, we're just seeing some hiccups. And I always like to really consider all the programs that we have in place to help stabilize and encourage economic growth. We still are in an overlap of our economic stimulus onto what we're now tightening with raising of interest rates and shrinking the balance sheet. And that overlap is kind of muting or hiding or masking some of the problems we're starting to see. But uh, as we roll forward the next couple of months, we'll start to see that, you know, we're still pro producing. We still do have a lot of a elevated inflation, but things are slowing down a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. The the Fed funds futures I mentioned there, they're always just about the market's betting. And we found that the market is never right, but the direction is usually pretty good. And one of the things on here direction-wise, you really start to see that green band flattening out down here at the bottom. And uh, your economic update that we published here uh, a few about a month ago talks about the Fed hitting a high point, maybe in the 2% range or two and a quarter, or somewhere close to there at December, at the December 22, and then actually potentially in March, the possibility of lowering rates. And so we, we've definitely been having some interesting conversations uh, these days and what's going on. Um, with that, you know, why, why is this taking place? And, and that's the toughest thing today. And then what we're seeing is inflation has, has been a, a, a bit of a pain. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, we've seen inflation go up much higher than the Fed likes and, and wants. And We've talked about this for a while. What happens and how do you get inflation? Well, you apply tons of cash and the government threw tons of cash at everything and you have a supply chain meltdown and you can't get products and, and scarcity value. And uh, that's resulted in some pretty pretty high inflation here. Consumer price index, 8.3, X food and energy, 6.2, PCE at, at 5.18. Um, you know, it seems to be pretty pretty big numbers, uh, although we are beginning to see a little bit of, of, of turns there. It looks like they're coming down a little bit right now. Your thoughts on that? Yep, we're seeing a little bit of a lightening of uh, the inflationary pressure. Pressure, And the term that uh, people like to use is a deceleration, which means we still are above our long-term target, above that 2% for inflation, but it, it is uh, decelerating, meaning not uh, continuing to grow. It's starting to contract a little bit uh, over that amount, over 2%. Yeah, so it's it's hard to keep growing at seven percent a year, and so it should start you know moderating a bit. Um, and I do think we are seeing some slowing in the economy. And you know, the Fed's not going to take this lightly. Last time we were in this situation it was back in '82. Um, you know, obviously there's there's some transportation issues, but there's, there's some demographic issues, lots of lots of things here. But one of the things I really wanted to point out is some of the big numbers up are gas and and cars. And um, you know, looking at the, the the car lots around Detroit, the the old lots, uh, there are more and more cars falling into those that are not for sale because they don't have chips. Uh, but it's hard to get them, and it's a supply and demand issue. And hopefully, we'll see that change. But uh, 
gas, cars, and furniture, some of the biggest increases of causing inflation today. Yeah, that's true. And if you kind of look forward, there's, you know, we're still going to see that big volatility that, uh, you know, oil is, and wheat issues that we're having from the Russia and Ukraine issue going on. But looking forward six months from now, I think there's still some upside for just some certain segments to have some major inflation. You know, whether it's, you know, we've shifted as a society to towards something like food delivery, for example. There's going to be a lot of inflation there, even if we solve the wheat problem coming down. And I think in the transportation sector, even if gas and oil come down, we'll still have a little bit of upward pressure in that sector a little. So it's like hit or miss on depending on uh, what sector we're talking about, but overall slowly coming down, Charlie. Uh, that'd be good. I, I do think as you get gas prices and food prices up, that does hurt people's disposable income. And that causes a little bit of a slowdown, which is one of the points you made in our, our last economic piece. Yeah. With that, you know, labor has been an interesting discussion. The labor force has, has been, um, you know, not going back to normal levels. Uh, we've been heading a little bit better back here with the labor force participation rate. We wish it was a little higher. Um, the unemployment rate is back to, to pre-pandemic levels. Um, what we're learning is people love remote work. They want to work remote. They want to have flexibility, though, more than remote. Uh, people want to be able to take kids to school and do different things. And so flexibility's come through. Uh, lots of changing in the labor force. But uh, we do see, uh, hopefully, the, the participation rate heading back up a little bit here. Yeah, talking about, uh, and you can just, it's perfect on that slide, you can go forward, but just one of the comments, I don't think we cover it, but the quit rate is still there. It's still really high. I mean, the uh, measurement of people that are leaving their job voluntarily, uh, the quitting rate, and manufacturing is one of the ones that are, is really high right now uh, compared to um, uh, compared to pre-pandemic numbers, it's like 90% higher, almost 100%. So it's it's going to be tough to uh, get people to change that mentality. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a bit, bit of a modification. And um, you know, speaking of mentality and change, we've actually seen a major shift in housing and who is buying houses. And it's really interesting to start looking at the number of people buying houses, the number of people, how long they've been in their existing houses for, uh, a lot of different things going on right now. And I know housing is a big conversation with the affordability as an issue. Uh, we do see affordability causing some problems, but there's also a whole big generation coming along buying houses right now. And so uh, we expect that, you know, if we do see a little bit of downturn in housing prices, it won't be a big one. It won't be for very long. Um, and we may see a little bit just based off affordability, but a lot of millennials entering that key home buying age right now. So we mentioned the consumer a little tight here. We do have gas prices in the bottom. We're up to uh, some pretty high record levels, four and a half dollars a gallon. The crude oil prices have kind of stabilized a little bit at these elevated levels with the uh, war and, and all the different things happening in this world. Um, definitely that's gonna keep uh, things a little bit interesting, but and that should have hopefully actually, unfortunately slow economic growth due to the cost of people putting gasoline in their cars. From here, the stock market's been an interesting spot. We've had a, a, a level in the NASDAQ of getting into correction territory. The S&P 500's right on the cusp of correction territory, and uh, so is the, the uh, Dow. We went up a long way. We, we've come back down a bit. Uh, it's, it's been an interesting, I, I wouldn't say bubble, but uh, you know, feels that we're getting back to some reasonable levels, but I would expect to see a little bit more downside before we bottom here. Any comments on that, Craig? No, I think you said it well with respect to a potential having a potential to have a slightly lower indices there uh, as an overall general market theme for the equity markets. Um, what we've been really deliberately doing, though, is starting to nibble into the market. I think this is just a gift for a lot of people because uh, we're not at the bottom, but we're pretty darn close. And, you know, someone on this chat, if you can just say it's me through the chat function on this uh the Zoom video is, is tell me who knows where the bottom is and we'll just buy it all at that point in time, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's industries that have really gotten their tail kicked and there's just uh, a great buying opportunities right now that we're starting to nibble into. So we're, we're not at the bottom, but we're pretty close. Yep. 
definitely some, 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 it's always, you know, never calling the bottom, never calling the top, just make good times to, to buy in and dollar cost average in. And it's, it's starting to look like that right now. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you. All right. Well, from there, uh, our overall, uh, we expect that the economy is going to continue forward. Uh, things are going to slow a little bit because of food costs, gas costs, and, and inflationary pressures. Uh, we'll see housing pro- sales continue to, to slow down a little bit and probably a little bit more continued negativity in the stock market. Um, do we get a recession? Do we not get a recession is a very, very tough question to answer. We definitely think things are slowing down. And again, from the economic piece that uh, Craig put together, uh, we went out about a, a month ago. If you don't have a copy of it, please, please reach out to the office. And it is also on our website. It'll give you some insight that we do think that by the beginning of next year, we're going to start to see the Fed potentially start easing a little bit. With that, uh, Craig, if anything else you'd like to add, or we'll move on to the next slide and start talking about uh, investment activities. Yeah, let's let's move on, Charlie. Okay. So uh, today's webinar, uh, and thank you for that great economic update, Charlie. I really appreciate that. Uh, today's uh, we're covering investments 101, and it's we're not going to get too deep into some details. We're going to reserve that for our future webinars, one being in June, which is investments 201. We'll get a little bit more technical today. We're going to keep it very high level, a little entry level uh, investment type uh, conversation, uh, and we're going to start off with the policy. And um, the reason we want to do that is when we look at uh, regulatory bodies of the FDIC and NCUA, they've got their Bible that they come in and they uh, are looking at for the guide for examination. And one whole section uh, is dedicated to it. In the credit union world, it's uh, chapter 12. And um, they talk about a lot of different stuff. And one of the very key things is the policy. And it's not because they want to know that your policy is written correctly, but they want to make sure it's written so you guys are running an organization with your minds on everything that is important to make sure that you're not putting the institutions, your institution, at too much risk and they want to make sure there's steps and procedures that are followed and who and so we'll talk a little bit about that now for some of the key components that the policy may must contain and the first and foremost is you know we're lending institutions right and if we're not lending we're going to when we have excess liquidity we're going to be investing and so that policy starts to apply to what and how we're using that liquidity and we want to have a purpose and an objective for our investment portfolio. Kind of laying out why we have one, because not everybody has an investment portfolio, believe it or not, the majority do. Uh, But the percentage of the assets that are allocated towards the investments vary vastly, anywhere from 75% all the way down to, like I said, 0% of assets. And you want to also have an objective. So the people that are making decisions do understand why they're investing, what decisions they're making, and how is it impacting the the institution so you know that you're deploying assets the way that policy dictates and uh, the board really wants you to. And that's the segue into your corporate governance is the policy will determine and lay out that the board is ultimately responsible. responsible. It talks about the delegation of that power to management, whether it's just a couple executives or your CFO. It, it, it dictates who can make decisions on their behalf. And then also it further delegates if you're allowed to hire an outside investment manager. And that could be uh, uh, to an RIA like McQueen Financial uh, for a standard investment portfolio. There's a difference between discretionary and non-discretionary. And for traditional investment portfolios, it's typically a non-discretionary delegation of authority where you as an institution are retaining that authority, but using the RIA uh, to look, examine, analyze, and recommend what would be best suited for that balance sheet. Then also it goes down to authorized assets and how much you can put into each of these assets. Limits uh, would be going towards a percentage of equity 
it could go towards a percentage of assets or overall portfolio. Uh, it also identifies minimum credit ratings if we're introducing credit into the portfolio by means of municipal bonds, corporates. You actually could look at asset-backed securities as well, but it'd, have, it'd be credit uh, underwritten as well in the credit uh, process. And then lastly, getting into uh, where does the product come from? What vendors and the broker dealer do you utilize? Those have to be identified and vetted on a regular basis, annually pulling down their disclosures, their financials to understand your counterparty risk. And then uh, also the policy, we'll talk about pre-purchase analysis. We're going to talk a lot about uh, just some of the individual type of asset classes that we could look at, but the pre-purchase analysis will, uh, in the policy, identifies what are some of the things you must document from a credit perspective, from an interest rate risk perspective, from a pricing perspective, a lot of different things that must be done prior to making an execution or purchase of a security. So um, lastly, on this policy, it, it's a core policy for your institution. It needs to be re-examined on an annual basis by management and represented to the board with if there are any changes and if no changes, just the reaffirmation that our policy is current and relevant and that goes into your meeting minutes. So one of the things that's extremely important as we do see changes from different regulatory bodies, we want to make sure that your policy captures though on an ongoing basis. Because as we all know, either accounting changes or regulatory changes, they don't happen as often as people would think. But when they do, it sure you sure will get written up if you don't capture it and start practicing what needs to be done. So I think that covers a base high level policy information for now, Charlie. So let's move forward. All right. Off to uh, risks. Yep. The uh, part of the policy that gets uh, more involved into making sure that management who gets delegated from the board, the authority to, to make decisions about the investment portfolio is to understand the risks that are involved that they are exposed to. And here's just listed a few of them, and I'm not going to talk about every single one of them. Uh, if you do have a question, please, again, chat's there, raise your hand, we'll answer your question. But a couple just to talk about, which I think are extremely important, is that very first one is interest rate risk. Because in the investment world, you are actually managing, managing typically a big percentage of your institution's assets. It's not that a customer of your institution's coming in and saying they want this uh, an auto loan or a mortgage where that asset goes on to your books and, in, and affects your interest rate risk, where the investment portfolio, you make the decisions. You can decide whether we're keeping it short or long or variable or fixed. Uh, what The different characteristics that actually marriage well with the rest of your balance sheet. And so understanding interest rate risk when managing an investment portfolio is critical, whether you're doing it yourself or you're having an outside advisor do it with you. So it's very important. So it's a big risk in how you can change or ma and manage your interest rate risk of your balance sheet. The other thing just is I'm going to go top and bottom. Why not? We'll look at credit risk. That's the other thing is, is it does lay out what are the minimum stipulations for credit when looking at uh, investments that are involve credit risk. And that's where we get into corporate bonds, bank notes, municipal bonds, some asset-backed securities of that nature. And it lays out what minimum credit must be there, how often you need to look at it, and making sure you have analysis is there, is there as well. All right, let's turn the page there and go to uh, just a couple more items here. And this starts talking about um, once you have your investments are made, you're followed, you're crossed your T's, you're dotted your I's, you got your documentation filed away in your folder somewhere where you're probably never going to look again, right? <laughs> it's not, don't say yes. I heard you guys <laughs> nod your head. <laughs> is 
Uh, what happens if you have a holding? So your monthly report that gets put together has a credit rating downgrade alert. Oh, oh this is outside of our policy. You know, and there's actions. Your policy will lay out what needs to be done. And it's gonna gotta be very specific. It's gonna identify who in your organization must do what. Typically they'll fall upon your finance officer or CFO has to evaluate, make a determination of what to do and then present that to a determination or recommendation to the board of directors at no later than that the next board meeting. Uh, and once again, that policy needs to specifically identify that position and who's responsible for what. And the board will either say, yep, I affirm what you're saying, or, you know, Joe, you might have been out drinking at lunch. We need to disagree with you on this one. We're going to, let's, <laughs> let's just sell this thing. You know, that's the board's ultimate decision, but it's going to be laid out there. Other things is just talking about safekeeping. And I, I want to just pause there for a moment and talk about safekeeping because there's a lot we're, on another page we're going to talk about, but it's really important when you're looking at a uh, third party to custody your assets to make sure you're doing your due diligence on them, pulling down their financials, make sure it's a good counterparty to be able to uh, hold those securities. And then also uh, make sure that they do uh, uh, don't rehypothecate your securities, meaning use your custody assets and lend them out into the marketplace for their benefit for liquidity reasons. You know, they should not be because those are your assets that are held there. Very important on that due diligence process as you go through that. It also talks a little bit about uh, some accounting stuff. And Charlie always likes to say, we are professional accountants. Wait, 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 wait. Did I say that right, Charlie? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, uh, we're not professional accounts. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I'll add something on here. You, you said it, and I'll say it a little differently, making sure that safekeeping and conflicts of interest, if, if you all of your investments are safe kept with one entity and you're only trading with one that one entity, they know it because they know where the bonds are purchased from and they can see exactly what you're paying. And it becomes an interesting conflict of interest of understanding pricing. So just be very careful with safekeeping and bond accounting and conflicts there. All that, a lot of good intent, there's also data that can be used against you in pricing. Yeah, very well said. And we'll, we're actually going to talk a little bit more about that, can, but it is extremely important to understand that concept there. I got a little excited early on. Sorry about that. Uh, no, it's okay. I love it. Remind me again in case I miss it as well. Um, so, yeah, so it'll identify some things on bond accounting and whether you're AFS or held to maturity or trading, and we don't need to. So let's go into the basics of bonds. It's the spirit of 101 here. After we have our policy set, we've got to basically understand what we can buy or at least what we want to. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, somebody, somebody has to help out in the chat room. Is, give me your favorite James Bond character, you know, was it, was it Pierce Bronson? Was it Sean Connery? Is it James Craig? Does, does anybody have a favorite, you know, the James Bond uh, actor? Now we're getting a few Sean Connery's coming in right okay. now. Okay. I wish and, I could do uh, his accent. I know there's yep. a really cool Saturday Night Live skit with Sean Connery. Yep. Uh, James Craig's got a couple votes too. Roger Moore just came in strong. Yep. All right, well, we got a number coming in. There's a lot of James Craig's fans out there. Daniel, well, you have to be, you know, wait a minute. Is everyone named Craig on this thing except me? We got a, a, a Daniel Craig, a James Craig, a Craig Cecilia. I don't know. All <laughs> right, because of that, just in case I forget, I love our audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the bonds, there's a lot of different bonds, just like there's a lot of 007s over the years. There's there's a lot of bonds, and, and some bonds today are the same recycled structured product that they used to call a different name way back in the day. It's just they're renaming it and trying to cram it down people's throats again, quite frankly. But um, so what is a bond is, and I'm going to keep it really simple, is it's a debt instrument or a borrowing that an issuer does from investors for, for the promise to pay them back at some point in time in the future. And for that promise, they're being charged an interest rate. And you are buying just the full faith and credit of that issuer typically. Now there's other type of investments where it's dictated on revenue stream and whatnot, which gets into revenue bonds. But the high level definition is 
an issuer that promises to pay you back based on their full faith and credit. They trade on a par basis. So typically bonds will trade in increments of $1,000. So we're not buying bonds of $1,000, but when you look at par, a million bonds is like a thousand thousand, which is a million. But the par is when you're saying, I'm going to be uh, buying a hundred thousand of this investment or 250,000 of a CD. That's your par. Also referenced is a principal. You can use that simultaneously as well. It's your principal that's at risk. And that's where the, uh, the par comes into place. The coupon is that interest rate that I referenced earlier. You know, the issuers promise to pay you back, it char they get charged an interest rate, that's the coupon. And lastly, there's the maturity date and when and when do they uh, promise to pay you back. So that is a uh, cut and dry, simple type of bond. Now there's a lot of characteristics that can be added into this to make things very complicated. And that's where people get into trouble. And you know, not that you shouldn't, it's just you have to understand some of these other characteristics, whether it's the optionality of the issuer calling it away from you or the optionality of the issuer to change the coupon or the coupon to change based on some random index, uh, or the bond gets amortized down and you slowly get paid monthly for uh, the next 15 years, a little bit of principal every month, which is, you know, once again, an accounting issue, but all very good complicated things that causes somebody that's managing investments to have to understand. So let's turn the page a little bit here. Well, before we, we, okay, we did have one quick question that came in about rehypothecation of securities. What does that mean? And uh, the short version of that means is if your safekeeper is allowed to share and, and if someone wants to short your bond, if they're allowed to use that bond to be shorted. Um, why we don't like it is if uh, the broker's firm would go bankrupt, we have ability to potentially lose that security. And so we have to look at the risk related to that and the brokerage firm's ability to utilize our securities. So just a, a very cautious type of activity looking to really make sure we're, we're, we're protecting you. Anything else you'd add to that, Craig? Nope, good question. Very good, yeah. or, uh, and as well as a good answer, by the way. Well, I, I feel better now, you, you know. <laughs> could have started with a good answer and an okay <laughs> question would have been fine too, but. Uh, <laughs> all right, we're off to portfolio strategy here. Okay, so strategy is, um, a very much a key element of your investment policy. And, the, and it is really the guide for who's managing your portfolio, whether it's your CFO or it's your whole co committee of people or you know an outside manager. What is the strategy of the portfolio is extremely as, as, uh, important in order to set decisions going forward. So turn the page once and we'll start talking about some of the components of a strategy. Um, to start out with your strategy is what do we traditionally have an investment portfolio for? And earlier I talked about some clients they, or some institutions don't have an investment portfolio. They lend, they're lent out hundred percent and, you know, which is fine. They just have to manage their liquidity a little bit more and they have to run a little bit more intensive stress uh, to their liquidity. And others, you know, the are go, go down to 80% lent out, some at 50% out, which I don't think the 50% want to be there. Their goal is to get up towards that 80%, maybe 90%. But what is, why do we have an investment portfolio? And there's a several reasons why you have them. One is, is, is for lending is, is to provide cash flow to your lending activities over time to fund them because you can't close all your loans at once, but they start to fund over time. And you may have a loan pipeline that stays at a certain dollar amount. It gets some loans get funded, which brings it down, but new ones get entered into the pipeline. There's a few that stay in there that, you know, are eternally going to be in the pipeline, right? To make lending numbers look good. Um, love you lenders, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it, one of the big components of that portfolio is to help support that. The other would be on cash flows. You know, we have uh, very much seasonal deposits, meaning that first four months of the year sometimes funds an entire balance sheet for the year as it slowly trickles back down and gets refunded in that first quarter and April. 
Um, so it does help fund some of those cash flow outs that are pretty much normal and cyclical. Uh, the other thing is, is if we have depositors that are withdrawing, it helps to uh, accommodate those as well. And if we have extra from the cash flow that the portfolio is providing, then what we're doing is we're dollar cost averaging those back into the current economic environment and reinvesting into the portfolio. Others may have just from a, and it's been kind of born out of the whole, what is our liquidity calculation is, is they have a minimum percentage of assets. Uh, we never want to be, somebody may say, we never want to be over 90% lent out. We want to have a little security blanket of liquidity and we don't necessarily want to hold it right in cash because cash is a very low yielding asset uh, versus the rest of the curve. Uh, but they also want to have that ability to, you know, pledge such for a lot lines or just have uh, earnings there in case something happens and they need that liquidity. And lastly, why do we have an investment portfolio is, is for earnings to help support the institution, especially if we're a lower loan to deposit institution, we got to have those investments to uh, boost up our earnings instead of just getting a rate of return on cash, because then we'd have a, probably a negative ROE and a negative ROA if we kept too much in cash as well. Anything yeah. you want to add to that, Charlie? You know, it, it's interesting. Um, duration of portfolio and structure, a little, a little bit of a foreshadowing here we're going to talk about in the next slide, uh, is so important. And, and knowing your loan to deposit ratio, knowing your, your needs for cash, but also knowing that if you have a low loan to deposit ratio, the whole balance sheet management ALM comes in, which really talks about having a little bit longer investment portfolio. You know, something um, we'll talk a little bit about, but negative convexity, making sure that not everything goes the wrong way when rates rise or fall for you. Uh, not having all mortgages as your investments and loans. Just some really interesting things to think about here. Um, but strategy is super, super important. And, and the structure of the cash flow is so important today. Excellent. All right, well, let's move on to the next slide and look at the principles of investing. So this has kind of been around for a long time. I prior to me having gray hair, so really long time is three or four the, days. Yeah, no. Three or four days. The sly principle. So first and foremost, these are listed in priority order as your institution manages your investment portfolio. You should always have in the forefront of your mind and 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 process is safety, safety of principle. We're not investing to hit home runs. We're investing for, for earnings and we want to make sure that the principle that we put out into the marketplace gets returned to us. And there's a couple of different types of risks that can take place. One is just like I mentioned, the risk to principle. This comes down to the point where you get into credit related investments corporate bonds, municipal bonds, where there is a potential where an issuer might not be in the position when it comes around to maturity point time to pay back our principal. The other is, is a premium risk based on the structure of the investment. So when you get into a bond that has optionality to it or amortizes, you need to factor in when doing an investment, the risk to the premium you pay, if you're paying a premium for your bond, meaning above a dollar price of 100. So for a million dollar investment, you're paying some a million, 50,000, you have a $50,000 premium. Well, that premium you need to amortize over time. And if that issuer for some reason has the ability to accelerate the return of our principal and we have to write off that premium right away we could have negative returns there and we'll never get that premium back so there's a couple different types of principles there to keep in mind there from a credit perspective and premium very important to understand and know the second thing is is the liquidity safety first liquidity second the um, liquidity is what is your understanding and what does your balance sheet need from a cash flow standpoint? Charlie mentioned, all right, we're lending out and we've got, we're a 30 year shop. We're going back to the SNL days, right? All we lend out on is 30 year mortgages and we're going to get very little cash flow on these for a long period of time. We'll get our monthly payments and premiums, but everybody's borrowing long, paying their minimum payments. So we're getting just kind of the interest cash flow on those. Well, our liquidity in our portfolio needs to offset some of the lack of liquidity coming about our lending portfolio. So we're going to invest a little bit short 
longer, or at least try to create a little bit of a shorter cash flow, we can rely upon in, in the event there's an unforeseen instance where we need it. Uh, so that's one example of why cash flow is so important to understand the needs of your balance sheet. The other thing is, is on the cash flow is kind of looking at your liability structure. Are, are we all non-maturity deposits? And I think the entire industry has gone away from having a CD. Actually, what's a CD again? Can somebody give me the definition of that? <laughs> um, uh, it's a compact disc. Yes, exactly. You use them to play <laughs> golf with. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or chase birds away as you hang them and watch them flutter in the sun. Yep. Um, yeah, so, or broker deposits, term deposits, if you have any, looking at those, what cash flow do we need to meet those? And we can use the investment portfolio to meet those anticipated cash flows. The other thing that from a liquidity standpoint is, is if we're using the right type of asset classes within your portfolio to provide liquidity, we can pledge to a counterparty for a line of credit. And whether it's to, from your course, your corporate credit union, your correspondent bank, or the federal home loan bank is three examples that'll provide lines to you, but they're going to want some type of collateral. If you use the, you know, whether it's agencies or mortgages, we can pledge them to provide liquidity from our lines as well. Then the last thing, which sometimes is the first thing that people always think about, because whenever we go and get a new client or talk to some people out in the marketplace is, well, what kind of yields should we expect? And they, 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 they gloss over safety and process and procedures and liquidity, and they just go, what's yield? It's important, but it's number three on the list as you're managing your portfolio. You got safety, liquidity, then yield. And, uh, you know, what yield are we looking at expecting based upon the type of portfolio that matches the rest of your balance sheet? Can it be a fixed rate investment portfolio that provides a good ladder of maturities without much optionality? A good example of that is in the upper right-hand corner, that chart there. It's a good bell-shaped curve there. And they notice the dotted line is, you know, a good smooth uh, amount of cash flows that, uh, from 23 is the second set of bars and then goes 24, 25, 26, 27, and then it tails off in 28. But very good deliberate. And then the gray and the green bar, they don't change much. They're, they're different, but that's the optionality in this portfolio. Not much change in cash flow. It's very reliable, helps management understand cash flow and what their needs and what they're getting back from a, a float so they can manage what other uh, investments, lending, or uh, deposit withdrawals they need to meet. The other thing you can look at is a barbell, right? Another big strategy that some people will talk about, and that's that lower right here, loaded up on the short end with maybe cash or one year and less maturities, and then some longer maturities, kind of ignoring the belly of the curve. So kind of trying to look out, and that kind of bodes well sometimes and maybe a really steep yield curve. So the longer you go, you got really high yields, and I think Charlie was showing, making fun of the, ups, the yield curve we have today, how flat it is going out. So not necessarily the environment today for looking at a barbell strategy, but it is something that some people do continue to use. The other thing in managing your yield is the optionality that you can put within your portfolio to help enhance those yields. We don't want to load up your portfolio with a lot of bonds that are negatively convexed, meaning if interest rates do drop quickly, the issuers can pay off your investments, give you your principal back, and then reissue in lower rate environment or amortize really quickly based on, based on the structure of, say, a structured CMO or something of that nature. So those are the kind of the principles when looking at your strategy that you should always have in your policy and what you should be following. So you have a good, prudent, deliberate, uh, a good, prudent process to go through when deploying liquidity. Charlie, anything you want to add to this slide? Yeah, principle? well, I want to, well, I think you've covered it really well. And as we uh, we're cooking along here, time-wise, we've got a question that came in and um, it was a good one. I did skip over this in the last slide. I started talking about something else and I mean, went two pages back. Um, came up, uh, gain, unrealized gain losses was a bullet point you had a, a couple slides back. And we do have a question that came out about it that, um, you know, people are obviously seeing some significant losses in their portfolios, unrealized losses in their portfolios. And uh, we've been asked by uh, an attendee, what can we share about it being paper losses and 
because it does affect um, regulatory capital and it, it does affect uh, things that makes it a little bit tougher in a Neve situation in a rising interest rate environment. Sure. Well, we can't change the unrealized loss number, right? Unless we, you know, drive interest rates back down. But one of the things that you kind of take away and talk to say, if it's questioned by your board, is to look at the cash flows of your portfolio, which haven't changed, right? We're committed, we have issuers, we got good solid issuers, and we're expecting those maturities to come back. It's a temporary loss uh, that's unrealized that we won't realize unless you run into a liquidity event where things have to be liquidated. That kind of gets down to that whole, what could we have? Make sure we have a good percentage of that portfolio that can be pledged against the line in the event we run into a liquidity event. Uh, but the best answer for that in response to somebody question that is, is it's a function of not being a credit issue. We still have good issuers, good credit, good structure of investments, but not a lot of extension risk. And we're expected to get our maturities back on these dates and uh, the unrealized loss will, will disappear. Yeah, I think it's, as you look at your, your pictures here, I like the structure of a portfolio today. And I, I'd love for today to be, you know, this year and next year, where we have a lot of maturities coming due. So even though we may be at an unrealized loss, we've got a lot of maturities coming due that we can utilize to reinvest into higher yields. Again, when we're not a bond fund, as, as we're not, we are when we're buying individual bonds, we're buying them for, for you know, again, for uh, the portfolio, they will mature. And when they come back and mature, they mature at par. So you just have to have the ability to, to last for that long. And, and that's something important. And that's why we structure and have really good structured portfolios. Yeah, well, that, I like how you said that, Charlie, because it brings up one other point. I know we're running into time constraints here. We'll fast forward a little bit, but that's another good reason why not to buy bond funds, even money market bond funds, because that NAV can fluctuate or short term bond funds. Well, you know, we can create that same thing with fixed income and you're getting your money back. It's not being marked to market like a bond fund has to be. Yep, that's, that's a great point. Bond funds can be very dangerous. As if uh, one person wants to sell, everyone takes a loss and they get marked to market versus owning your own bond. So very good point. Yeah. We'll hop into asset class diversification here. I'm, I'll um, move you right along. Just tell me when to move. Excellent. Um, okay, so yeah, shift to your left. Uh, so asset, <laughs> asset class diversification is extremely important. And one of the the biggest things that we see as we talk to new clients is we bring on a portfolio that doesn't have credit risk, but they do have a lack of diversification because the portfolio would have probably you know, 300 CD line items, and that's pretty much it, right? Very low diversity, and CDs are not necessarily a bad thing. Right. But once you start getting invested into the majority of the higher paying CD rates, there's a lot of yield that is given up when just having an investment policy that restricts you to go right into that asset class. And why is, is you know, is that first bullet point is yield. You know, we're not here to um, say you can't take credit risk and you can't buy a certain asset class. We're here to say. There's a lot of asset classes out there and the cycle of yield rotates amongst them of which is best at any given time. Right now, you know, we're looking at over the, you know, they kind of dissipated, but there was a window of like two or three weeks where CDs actually were really high. And now we're getting back into spreads on the, on the municipal market that are making more sense than the CDs. And having that ability as cash flows need to be, sorry, liquidity needs to be deployed onto your balance sheet. It's you having the ability to look at whether should I be looking at a corporate, should I look at a taxable municipal or a uh, mortgage-backed security versus a CD. Comparing all four of them should be a part of your process when making that deployment, choosing the best one. That, and all th you look at three that have very similar uh, durations and deploying into the one that offers up the best yield there. So it's really important to have that diversification. Yeah. Uh, it yeah, is interesting. Ahead. We saw CDs trading below treasuries and people were buying their CDs below treasuries. It was just amazing by, by not having them thinking in different ways. Right. 
Yeah, they're policy pigeonholed them. A couple of things. Uh, we know what Treasury did. I want to look at the time. Okay, yep. so I'll skip over a few things here. But Treasury bills and notes are guaranteed by the U.S. government. We all know what those are. They're the benchmark index of what credit-related stuff is spread off of, whether it's agency bonds, mortgage backs on the curve, some CMBS as well, as well as some others on the next page. But I want to pause on the agencies and just give a little bit one page back is the agency is one of the sections that we see a lot of pickups in in portfolios is you know, there's bullet agencies where there's not they're not callable. And that's where people invest. It's kind of just has a fixed maturity. It comes back. Callable bonds, people get caught into the trap and getting uh, drinking the, uh, the Kool-Aid of, hey, look at this extra spread on this callable bond. It's hitting a 4% now. We need to buy it. Well, we're in that marketplace when you're going to hear that. And that's when people are going to get caught because if we're right, I should say not if, but when rates come down, those bonds are all going to disappear they're gonna get called away by the issuer and you're gonna be stuck reinvesting in a lower rate environment. Step bonds are identical as well to that type of thing. Very hard to model. And especially if an institution is on the smaller side, under a half a, mil, half a billion, modeling step bonds is not happening. I can guarantee it's not happening correctly because there's, there's three things that are happening, but two most important ones is that coupon's gonna be changing. Second is the issuer has the ability to call those coupons the bond away from you at any point in time. And it's a tough thing to be modeling. So you can go forward to, there's some mortgage-backed securities and CMBS. A note on those, focusing on agency-backed CMBS, CMOs, and MBS. CDs, we don't need to talk about. Everybody uses those. Corporate notes and bonds, it's, they're rotating in and out of value, just like municipal bonds. Corporate notes and bonds are to, uh, basically the general obligation of an issuer. It's their full faith and credit of that issuer. And you need to really pull down their quarterly financials to run credit analysis every quarter. So you can determine a trend of their credits, a trend of their financials. So you can determine whether you have, you should have the ability to hold till maturity, but also the issuer has the ability to pay you back over the life of that investment, which is kind of falls into that definition of investment grade. Municipal bonds, both issuance of general obligation bonds, which is Adler and property tax and revenue bonds. They have different yields, just depending on what you're looking at and their credit rating. There's also taxable and tax exempt bonds. And on the left-hand side, you can see taxable bonds in the five-year, approximately a 360 right now. Now compare that to your five-year CDs that you're buying or the you know as you are rolling them. And then also the bank quality qualified tax exempt, which is a 285 that taxes up to about approximately 356. A couple of things and they're going down this, these are all the types of issuers, depending on your situation. If you're a credit union, you're not going to be looking at tax exempt, you'll be looking at taxable. If you're a bank, you'll be looking at both of those, just depending on which the best value on any given day. And then we talked about mutual funds and the risks in there. We're not a fan of municipal bond, mutual funds for financial institutions. We like mutual funds. There's a right place. There's a right portfolio, but not with any of our audience here today. Yeah, we do like municipal bonds. We do not like mutual funds. I think that's Correct. an easy way to put it. Uh, Long-term, short-term, any mutual funds at all. Yeah. Um, I, 360, that's just amazing. I'm used to seeing things at 0 0.6, and now we got a three there. That's <laughs> super exciting. It's a great time to deploy your liquidity into investments, bring a block in those investments for when rates come back down and lock in these nice yields. Don't, uh, don't stop your strategy. No, don't stop. Trading, uh, we'll talk a little bit about trading because it's really important to understand there's a lot of things that your asset manager, whether it's internal or external, has to pay attention to. We just went through a lot of them, type of quality, uh, uh, type of uh, asset classes, what their yields are relative to each other, credit type stuff. Now you got to get into, oh, I found out what I need to buy. Now I need to buy it. So that's where a lot of people also get really taken advantage out there, especially for the institutions that are only using one broker dealer. It's their friend for a long period of time. I don't want to question that, but I do want to question is, is what kind of revenue are you giving up to that, in, that individual and taking away from the, the, your institution? There's a primary 
and market. And that's where, where they roll into uh, primary dealers, underwriting new issue agencies, issuing uh, bidding on the treasury auctions, as well as the primary market for issuing municipal debt, new issues. It's, it's an it's a easy market to get into. You get current market prices. And the institutions that you, whether you buy a new issue from one institution or another, you should get pretty much the same price. On the secondary market, where the majority of investments are bought, purchased from everybody on this call, is where there's a lot of difference in pricing by dealers. And every dealer has a different specialty. There's some that are really good at several things. But if you're out there looking at a mortgage-backed security, you should have a big list of people that specialize in mortgage-backed securities and put them up against each other. This is a good example. We used this for our last presentation. It's very true. Happens every day. We are, you know, got over 12, almost 13 billion in assets. We do a lot of trades every day. Our range of and brokers out there is huge. And you can look at this one $2 million purchase that we took some live bids from, and you can see that then the broker one was the winner. You know, they were able to sell the bond to us, but broker two would have cost an extra 900 bucks and broker three was an extra 2,100 bucks. And that's for one trade. And you think about the number of trades you do over a year, it just really adds up. And it kind of, once again, importance of having a very diversified list of broker dealers that you work with and putting them in competition. And it's okay, you don't shy away from it. You don't, you let them know you're in competition. You got to look out the prudent thing for your assets. So extremely important. Um, and then documentation, uh, extremely important. You need to go through the process of pre-purchase all the way to post-purchase on documentation. Uh, we look at why is it important. And the first thing is identifying when you're thinking about buying something other than say a CD, you got to talk about what the description is, what are the characteristics, do they have optionality? Can that investment disappear or, or will it stick with us? Uh, do we got to make sure we manage that call risk uh, if we're paying a premium for it and understand what that risks are and what is the probability of it disappearing. Extension risk, if you're getting into amortizing product and understanding that, and if there's cash flows in a CMO structure, where do we rank? All that analysis needs to be done. And then lastly is like going through a summary of everything. Your policy needs to address everything that your primary regulator wants it to cover as crazy as it sounds they say it you have to do it and then you need to follow it and they'll come back and examine you to make sure that you followed those steps um, your strategy will differ from your peers your lending portfolio differs from your peers your deposit structure differs from your, your peers therefore your investment portfolio will as well because their portfolio needs to be managed to your your balance sheet and then making sure that diversification is omnipresent, whether it's the portfolio, whether it's your broker dealer list, whether it's who you're talking to for advice on uh, uh, um, how to manage your vendors. You need to make sure that that is diversified so you kind of keep yourself out of risk. And then detailed records post and pre-purchase. And a lot of that post-purchase also in the credit world is ongoing credit analysis, doing quarterly credit reviews on corporates, doing annual reviews on your credit analysis and ratings on your municipal bonds as well. Uh, that's a lot you just went through, Craig. I really appreciate that. As we wrapped up time, we, we did have a question come in I'd like to answer before we wrap stuff up. Um, you know, the pricing differences you highlighted a few slides back, um, there's some pretty big numbers. Do you see that type of stuff in other product type or is it just in mortgage-backed securities? Um, and actually, mortgage uh, the 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 it's a tr the pricing difference is in all securities, and it changes by credit. So treasuries is going to be the tightest pricing, and then you go go out to mortgages, and then you get into corporates and municipals get really wide as well. And so keeping brokers honest, and you know their definition of honest is different than our de uh, definition of honest. They think they need to get paid so they can go out and you know take a trip to Florida every time they do a trade. That's what they think is it's worth right we know that's not true but everybody's definition of what is fair it's different and it's important so but it's across all products unless it's a new issue 
Yep, that's the other thing. But yes, the answer is all products, you should be putting everything in competition. Treasuries even get different marks. And there's always someone that's going to be the best. But as Craig said, there's different different things there. So thank you very much, Craig. Really appreciate the information. Uh, some great basics, a great 101 on investments, and what investments do. Uh, really appreciate your expertise in helping us. The next webinar we have is on June 8th coming up. It's going to be a mid-year economic update. And if you have any questions or like to sign up for it, please reach out to your MFA advisor or Kaylee and the link below. So with that, thank you all. We really appreciate the time and uh, we look forward to talking with you soon. Enjoy spring and the wonderful environment we're in. Thank you. And thank you, Craig, for helping. Yep, thank you. Have a great afternoon, everybody.